presentation, the last, uh, the last presentation, uh, let me just present the presenters. Dr. Dov Maimon is the senior fellow, is the senior fellow at uh, J J JPPI, the Jerusalem-based uh, Jewish people uh, think, tank, think tank. His PhD, he holds PhD from uh, the University of Sorbonne, uh, won the best uh, prize uh, uh, for the uh, work uh, uh, during his PhD uh, studies. He's teaching today at School of uh, Business Administration at the Ben-Gurion University in, in Beersheba. And the second presenter is a very different, it's, uh, his name is uh, Philip Carmel. He was born in Manchester in the UK. Uh, Philip made Aliyah in 1987 to, to Kibbutz uh, Male Gilboa. He's currently European Policy Advisor to the European Jewish Congress. He lives with his wife, Sandra, and three kids in Brussels. Please, Dov. Thank you, Robert. First of all, I want to thank the Israeli Foreign Ministry, and particularly Gidon and all his staff, for what has been a tremendously interesting and very much a tactless-based conference. I want to tell you that in the course of my job, I attend a lot of conferences around the world. And quite often, when we come to workshops, we draw up action plans before we have the workshops. Because we know that in the workshops and in the plenaries, we're all really going through the motions and it's really only a network sharing operation which gives us an opportunity to, to meet people who, who, who we met the previous week and who we will meet the next week. But we didn't do that here. And we didn't do it simply because the work in the workshops was extremely constructive. People came to us from many different perspectives. They contributed. They influenced, they changed minds, and they gave us new thoughts. Ostensibly, the subject of our working shop, the maintenance and the continuation of uh, diaspora Jewish life, does not belong in an anti-Semitism conference. Ostensibly, it belongs in a conference about Jewish culture, or Jewish identity, or Jewish continuity, or Jewish education. But if there were any doubts at all whether the issues of which affect Jewish community life and Jewish practice, such as attacks on Jewish slaughter or Jewish brit milah, if there was any doubt at all about whether those issues were linked with anti-Semitism, we received a very stern reminder about that on Tuesday with one of the most anti-Semitic cartoons I have ever seen in a Norwegian paper, in a mainstream newspaper in Europe. Clearly, attempts to attack Jewish religious practice are linked with anti-Semitism, if not by motive, then certainly in their results. I want to tell you that it's very natural that we, along with, it, with many other groups here, even though we're here in the, in the Middle East, were a very Eurocentric group. We were a Eurocentric group because most of the attacks which we see today occur on the European continent. Whether in Holland attacking Oshkita, whether in Germany attacking, or Germany or Scandinavia attacking the Brit Mila, they may be occurring today in, Euro in Europe which is very much based on a strong democratic tradition where issues of human rights and children's rights and animal rights are in the forefront. But these issues take time to come to the forefront in other continents which have not got that kind of democratic history. In other words, what we see today on the European con continent, make no mistake about it, you will soon see in Latin America and in Asia and in and in other countries which have Jewish communities. And therefore the experiences which we have along with Jewish communities around your, your Europe are vital to draw lessons. I should tell you, because it's not spread around a lot, 
that in recent years we have had a history of success. Every single attempt, whether on a pan-European level in the European U U Union to attack Schieter, whether in the Netherlands to ban Schieter, which was initially passed in, in, in the lower house of the Dutch Parliament and which was ultimately overturned in the Dutch Senate, whether in the German Bundestag, where the thumping majority was passed to, to, uh, to uh, allow for Schieter, Jewish communities working together, utilizing the resources of the communities which have those resources, quite often for communities which do not have those resources. And this gives me a wonderful opportunity to thank in particular the British Jewish community and uh, Mr. Arkush, who, who represented them here and gave a wonderful pre pre presentation of the work which of the British Jewish community have done both in Britain and also aiding other Jewish communities in fighting for Shechita rights and for the Mila rights. But we should be aware that winning votes is not the same as winning arguments. We've been very lucky on the one hand that the first time there was a concerted attempt to ban Brit Mila, even if it came about by accident because of the, of the lack of any legislation in the first place, occurred in Germany. We all know it was very easy for Jewish communities and for Jewish organizations to run to and round Berlin and use Nazi canards and anti-Semitism and 1933 and Holocaust and all sorts of nice words which work well to guilt trip Germans. But I have to tell you that even though that worked in Germany and it may have given us a certain amount of sucker for future campaigns, it will not work in other places. One of the things we learnt in our workshop was to take on issues, was not to just firefight, but to prepare academically, to prepare politically, to lobby, to write the brochures, to be ready, to be proactive in making sure that we don't have another Germany again, where legislation does not exist on the statute book, and we fall through that hole of, of a lack of legislation. We also discussed, and it came up quite regularly, the need for standardization as much as possible within a halachic framework within Jewish communities. People who do not like us for one reason or another will use our differences to divide us when they are fighting political campaigns against us. And things that do not look nice aesthetically whether in New York or whether in Berlin, do not aid the fight for Brit Mila and put Brit Mila at threat, not just from the political echelon, but also within Jewish communities. Because the truth of the matter is, is that most of the people in our communities don't really know what Brit Mila and Shkita is. And the less they know about it, they generally uh, prefer it that way until they actually come face to face with it. So we also have to be aware within our own communities that Jewish practice is portrayed in the most positive, modern, healthy way possible. I'm going to say something controversial and you're supposed to, as we say in Ivrit, to mevarechet ha'achsanya. I am here in Israel, and I have to tell you, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs accepted in this issue, that we have had no end of trouble, and it came up regularly in our work, uh, work, workshop, of the effect of lone wolves, loose cannons, Knesset members, chief rabbis running round the European continent not coordinating with Jewish organizations, making backdoor deals with politicians, and undermining the struggle of Jewish communities 
to protect the rights of their communities. That must stop. And the people who can stop it... And the people who can stop it most, the people best equipped to do that, and they admitted it within our workshop, are the foreign ministry, who I know are giving advice and trying to make sure that Israeli public servants paid out of Israeli taxes serve the interests of their government and the interests of the Jewish people and not their own personal political agendas. Let me say, take this opportunity to say that the need for coordination is great. I'm going to conclude, I'm sorry. The need for coordination is extremely great. Many of our Jewish communities around the world do not have the resources to run around every single political party, to speak to every MP, to write all the policy papers, to put out the press releases, to have all the information available to fight these campaigns in the way they should be fought. There are many Jewish organizations here and many strong communities which do have those resources. And we're extremely thankful. I particularly think of institutions in the Board of Deputies in, Brit in the, uh, Britain and in the Consistoire in France who've been extremely supportive in this. And to finally make a point, and it may be not within the purview of our own workshop. I want to say that as a representative of the European Jewish Congress here, representing umbrella organizations of Jewish communities around the European continent, that in one sense it's been an immense ple pleasure to have diplomats here from the Republic of Hungary. It is a wonderful step, psychologically, to come to the psychologist's couch and admit you have a problem. And I congratulate them on that. But when they leave the psychologist's couch, we have to make sure that the lessons that they draw from that are taken out into the field. We received today, this morning, a press release from Mazahic, if my Hungarian is not great, I apologize, about the institution of a square in the middle of Budapest of an author, a Nazi ideologue, supporter of Horthy in the war, supported by the Municipal Council of Budapest and the Lord Mayor of that city. I do hope, if there are any representatives of the Hungarian Republic still in this room, that they take the promises that they brought here and they take them back to, to Hungary and they make sure that that proposal, that initiative is thrown out of the window and done as soon as possible. And finally, I'm the demagogue, but the work of this group is undoubtedly down to Dr. Dov Maimon. Dr. Dov Maimon's vision and concern for the continuity of the Jewish people around the world came through at every point in the preparation and the work of this group. And it's been my absolute pleasure to work with him, as I have done in the past and I hope to do in the future, and my pleasure to pass over the floor to Dov to make some additional comments. Thank you very much. I will be very brief. I will try not to disappoint my friend who spoke with me before me. Listen, uh, I, I'm working for Jewish People Policy Institute, and we take care of the future of the Jewish people. And you say, why, would, why I spent three days here? And more than that, with uh, my good friend Gidon to prepare this, this, all this event, it's because we have some worry about European Jewry. We are not worried with the sporadic violence in Paris or, or in Scandinavia, Greece, or, or Netherlands, Hungary. It's not a risky, it's not, it's, not, it's not a threat to Jewish continuity, to Jewish future thriving in Europe, or Jewish life in Europe. What we are afraid, it's something different. 
is because all the attack that we see, like circumcision and uh, in, 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 in circumcision in Germany and Austria and, and Schrita in, in France, uh, uh, Holland, uh, Poland, and already, already four or five countries where it is already f uh, forbidden, and over five or six other things that we see everywhere in Europe with schools, public funding, and, uh, and many other things all around. It's all together, it's come like a kind of delegitimization of Judaism in Europe. That means it's a kind of public marginalization of the Jews, of Judaism. When we say that the Judaism is a barbaric practice, when you say that Judaism is a barbaric practice because of Shrita, because it's of Brit Mila, people just decrease their Jewish profile. They just say, you know, okay, I, they prefer to, prefer to decrease their Jewish profile. So what we expect, if nothing is done, it's something like that, the scenario that we may expect in Europe, which is very, I hope it will not happen, but it's looking like if nobody does something, and I don't know exactly who is in charge, is that we have something like 10% of the Jews of Europe will relocate, 20% will go to some self-segregation neighborhood like in London, in Paris, in other places, in Verpen and so on, and then more than 50%, something like 500,000 Jews will do what Franz Kafka called voluntary amnesia. They just forget to be Jew. They just decrease their Jewish profile. So we have a kind of polarization at the moment. You see a lot of thriving in many communities, especially in London and Paris, and also in Vienna, a bit in Budapest. And all that is, is a kind of, uh, it's not, there is another story. A big part of the Jews, so some part, some part of the Jews become more committed, a big, a, a big part go away from that and a, a large part of the Jews will go disappear. So we are going to lose something like 500,000 Jews if we don't do nothing. So who is in charge? It's not the EU. The EU is not in charge of the identity of people. The EU is not in, in charge of physical integrity, physical protection. It's not uh, its job. The state of Israel, maybe, maybe other communities in the world, maybe the community by themselves. I would just want to share with you some do data that we, the, um, Sylvia Deval, from the EU delegation in Tel Aviv I, I provided yesterday at the Mike Wine, uh, Mike Wine uh, from the CST uh, uh, um, session workshop. And few, few numbers, 26% 20 of a Jewish respondent claim to have experienced anti-Semitic harassment at least once in the last 12 months. 7% have experienced physical attack or threat in the last five months. And more from us, it's more something I would like to take in account. About 40 to 50% of the Jewish respondents in, in France, Belgium, and Hungary are considering emigrating. So for us, we say that something is happening there. People don't feel comfortable. So it's not a risky on the physical risk. We don't care so much about physical ways. We can have protection, you can move, you can do many, relocate to special neighborhood. But when we don't feel so much comfortable, what could happen is a lot of Jews are going to decrease their Jewish profile. And for us, it means that the young people would prefer not to say that I'm with Israel, not to say that I'm Jewish, because it makes a lot of noise and, and discomfort about the people all around. And this is something that is not anti-Semitism in some way, but it's also a, a, a danger for the Jewish thriving in Europe. So it's something that we have to take care of. This is what I wanted to say, how to, what we have to do. So one, I can tell you the reason the chief rabbi of Israel and is going to travel to Berlin and do that. He will not do that in Washington or he will not do that in other places in the world because the, the European Jewry has no voice in the Israel-European Jewry dialogue. The European Jewry has no voice in the European Jewry, US Jewry dialogue. There is no voice at the EU. So this is the situation. They are not organized. The only thing that we have to do is to bring all these people together and to build a vision where they want to be in 20 years or 15 years from now and to work on that, to be proactive, not to wait for the next attack on circumcision where or there or another place, not to wake up in the morning and say we have to go to the TV and to say something about it because we already know a lot of things that could happen in the next coming years. New attempt to ban or to attack Judaism in some way, we are part of another story, a bigger story. It's a backlash against multiculturalism, a backlash against a demographic shift in Europe, and we are some kind of collateral damage in Europe.
So what we have to do is something different. We have to, be, we have to understand the threat to, to be able to organize a think tank or something which is able to, to get the situation, to grasp what is happening there, and then to think proactively how we do that with political influence, with intellectual influence, how to work with the State of Israel in a coordinated way, how to, to, to work with American Jewry so they don't open offices where they want in Europe and do what they want according to their own agenda, we sometimes according to the Jewish agenda, local Jewish agenda, sometimes is different. So we have to be careful of that. And nothing is done. I don't see that nobody does in some way. The big, big success is Shrita UK and Mila UK, who have been successful very much. And we have to increase, to build on that, to do something even better and to be proactive. So this is the recommendation that what, uh, some kind of explanation of what uh, my colleague have presented before. Thank you. Okay, I think the message that was delivered by all three, three groups is uh, clear and uh, sound, and we have representatives also of the, of the foreign ministry, obviously, here in the room, with Ambassador Bahar, and I see the Ambassador uh, Shabash also sitting here uh, uh, with us. I think that uh, the key words that were repeated all the time are the coordination, the education, the legislation, and proactive activities. We have something like five to seven minutes for questions uh, from the floor. Just please, when you identify, identify yourself, and uh, please for the uh, panelists, uh, give short answers, and please ask even shorter questions, because we have only five, seven minutes. Please. I don't know if there is a mic. Yeah, there is. It's here. Sammy Apple from Venezuela. Uh, uh, Just say to whom you refer the question. Anne-Marie, uh, you're an educator, and uh, when I was uh, at the ICCA meeting in London, uh, the lady serving uh, coffee at the uh, parliament asked me uh, if I could say in four words, uh, what does that word that is all over the place means, and that word was anti-Semitism. And I said, I took my little bicycle that you mentioned, and, which is a sound bite, and I said, Irrational hate against Jews. If somebody was to ask you today when you go out and say, give me in one sentence what interfaith dialogue is all about, what would you say? Henry? It was an easy question. what it is or what it should be. <laughs> well, I would say what it should be. It should be close relations with other faiths, spiritual leaders who have impact on their respective communities. It can be on different levels. It can be theological discussions, or it can be knowing the other religion, the common values, the differences, the fundamentals, the history, giving knowledge to the other and understanding the other not as an alien, but as someone who is a human being like I am. This, I would say, is the interfaith not only dialogue, because you've got to be two, but it is the encounter with the other and finding the same human values, but learning what the differences are and making the other know what we are and knowing what he is. Thank you. Please. And then, and then. Uh, I, I, I just, so, sorry, I just want to add, because on purpose, I did not repeat what is the plan, but there was in the plan, there was something missing, and I think this is very important. Uh, Grand Mufti said that anti-Muslim uh, feelings or anti-Christian uh, minority feelings or anti-Jews uh, feelings and discrimination, sometimes it's a common fight. I will add something anti-women right is the same. Yes, please. Um, 
forward sharing wisdom, fostering peace. Um, the motto of the Elijah Interfaith Institute, which I represent here, and I just needed to make a comment that there are many interreligious experts, interfaith experts in this room and were present in the workshop. Uh, Jeremy Jones has run the Australian Human Rights uh, Medal for his work in interreligious dialogue. Uh, Dr. Russell Wyman from the Temple University Dialogue Institute was in the workshop we had from Canada, Britain, and from here in Israel. And I think that all three uh, workshops came together on the issue of uh, circumcision in Germany, where here was a law that was unacceptable and um, an issue for Jewish survival and the Jewish future, and a big part of the battle was support from our Christian friends, whose friendships have been nurtured through interreligious dialogue. And my question is, how are we going to take the fantastic work that is already done, often with Jews at the forefront, in interreligious dialogue, and feed it in to this organization and make sure that it's ongoing and not, and there was a great deal of ignorance about what's already going on. How are we going to feed it in and make the unified effort so we can take best advantage of it? Okay, Philip, uh, volunteer to, to answer, but sure. I'm sorry to butt in here because it's not really my, my workshop, although well, you did raise the, the circumcision issue. But I'm also the Director of Interfaith Relations for the European Jewish Congress, and I have a wide experience in that field. I have to say that we tend to pick and choose with Christian organizations. The Christian organizations were very helpful in the Netherlands, and they were helpful in Germany, and they've been helpful in many places. But if we look at many of the BDS campaigns which are going on now, a lot of them are taking place within mainstream Protestant churches. Because we have, it's very comfortable for us often to work with non-mainstream Protestant organizations who are very much on message in terms of Israel. And there is a feel-good factor to working with those kind of Pentecostalist, Baptist type groups and also in, no, in no, the United States. If there's a lesson for which we should take on board because on the one hand we work very well with the Catholic Church which is very easy, it's very hierarchical, it's very easy to go to the Vatican, it looks good on photo opportunities. But when it does come to interfaith dialogue with Christian groups we should not exclude whatever their political views are, mainstream Protestant churches, Lutherans, Calvinists, Anglicans, and people like that. And I do have the feeling that within a lot of the Jewish world, those kind of institutions, and we've seen with boycott campaigns by Lutheran churches in Germany, by oh, the Church of Scotland, by the Church of England in England, by the Calvinist Church in Hungary is a completely, I mean, it's off the map in, term, in terms of its uh, uh, support for Jobbik in certain places. That should not be excluded, and that should also be a part of interfaith dialogue. Okay, short remark from uh, Dina. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to thank you for your question. That is also is shown how... Uh, the, there are interrelations among the, the ten groups that uh, uh, Gidon has put, and this is the time to thank him again and 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 Ruth. <laughs> but, and Ruth, of course. But I, my short comment is, I, I don't know to, uh, how to get to the end of it, uh, of this comment. But uh, we many times feel a the Jews are on, if not on the wrong front, at least perceived as being on a front that puts them in a very difficult situation. Because what is legislation about? Legislation is about limiting. And limiting is about going against what is done here and there, and limiting expression, and expression uh, and, and the speech, and the uh, gathering, and etc., etc. And Shita and Brit Mila, if you change a bit your, your mind and look at it, not in Jewish eyes, but in other eyes, what is it? It's a defense of habits that are being carried for 3,000 years, and it puts you in a position 
of a, a non-modern non -modern society, a society that has to, to defend, to, def to deeply defend this, uh, uh, these habits. So I, I said I don't know how to get out of my remark, how to get to the end of it. It is a difficult situation and it is accompanied, the situation that we are in is so because of a lot of ignorance. And so if you ask us, we are not the ones to give two big answers, but if you ask us what to do, to spread knowledge, knowledge, knowledge about the Jewish people and what it really is. Anne-Marie, very, very short. Very shortly, uh, I want to answer. Uh, I didn't mention, but the, the third point that we came to was to have a follow-up of this group, to, to, to have a very small structure so that we get out to all the organizations which exist and which were not here, because obviously there are lots of organizations who are working in every country, and this network, of course, should be uh, coordinated. So again, I am very grateful to all the people who work already in the interfaith uh, uh, issue, which is not my case as my, my experts uh, nearby, but nevertheless, in the Eladine project, we are launching an important interfaith project of training Muslim imams, priests, rabbis, of a little bit when they are going to be trained to learn a, a little bit about the religion of the other. And until now, this is being soutenu, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, supported by the most eminent leaders of the three religions. Thank you. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have uh, time for more uh, questions. I see many hands uh, in the room. I would like to thank all the panelists. I think we had an outstanding uh, presentations, and uh, Gideon will present the next uh, session.